Hello, I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. And this is the Standing With Stones Megalithic Podcast. This podcast is only made possible by monthly donations from our listeners who've supported us through Patreon.com. You can become one of our patrons for as little as a dollar a month by visiting patreon.com slash standingwithstones. Welcome to the third of our monthly rounds of megalithic magnificence. That's three already, Mike. How did that happen? I have no idea. Fortunately, there's so much new stuff coming in from all sides, I can't imagine us ever running out of things to talk about. Anyway, in this month's instalment of Neolithic News and Prehistoric Pearls, who writes this stuff, as well as our regular items, for our main topics we'll be looking more deeply into Aubrey Hole number 7 at Stonehenge, and then discussing how the thousands of years of rising sea levels have engulfed coastlines, submerging countless prehistoric sites which are only gradually being discovered. So, as is usual now, we're starting off the show with our Pushing Back the Boundaries item. What have you got this month, Rupert? Well, this one is slightly contentious, but whichever way we look at it, boundaries have shifted. Now, there's been some debate for many years over how long ago hand axes first spread out of Africa and into Europe. Now, the majority of archaeologists believe that it was around half a million years ago, which is long enough, you'd think. But the argument was that a couple of sites in Spain seemed to be giving dates going back as far as 900,000 years. Whoa. I know, but the thing is that the evidence wasn't completely solid, so it was impossible to get any kind of consensus. But new findings in the rock shelter Cueva Negra del Estrecho del Rio Quipar. Are you impressed? I'm always in impressed, Rupert, Spain, always. <laughs> have pushed back the dates and researchers have, for the first time, got confirmed dates of around 850,000 years for both hand axes and it's the earliest confirmed use of fire. In Europe. Now, wait a minute. Now, I'm I'm uh, I'm actually hearing this for the ver- first time, and <laughs> um, uh, well, you, we really are pushing back the boundaries here. Then that it's, is really quite something. It's I mean, it's way out of our usual sort of time mm. zone, but you know, we have to go there with, to be pushing back the boundaries in the first place, don't we? Yeah. Well, indeed. Uh, yeah. uh, the thing is, it, it marks a significant cultural shift, but. Obviously, it's impossible to say whether man had learnt to actually make fire or if they'd just gathered burning embers after a forest fire. Because, you know, if you gather the burning embers, they could take them back to their own cave and use it to start their own fire or just feed a fire that uh, that they already had, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, once they've got a fire going in the cave, then they could keep it burning indefinitely. Yeah. But um, but the thing is, there's another aspect to this story, and it's one of the real mysteries of human evolution, and that's the Achillean axe. Now, if you don't know about it, the Achillean axe is the first consistently formed bifacial stone tool. So where a, a flint has been cut on both sides... And uh, they, they came in different sizes, so they could be used so, as so to, axes. So the Aculean mm. axe, is it, is it, where does that name come from? Do we know? It comes from the place where it was uh, first found. Now, that's something. But, that, but now uh, it's the, the term Aculean axe is used to describe generic, um, uh, generically any... Yes, because the, the, this, the bifocal, this yeah, form of axe rather. was found or is found all over the place. Um, and it comes in different sizes, so uh, you know, uses axes or picks or cleavers. You know, but thing is, all with this recognisable, consistent form. And and the thing is that the Aculean axe appears first in Africa, one and a half million years ago. And here's the thing: it remained pretty much unchanged 
for a million years. Ah, right. Now, I got you. I've got, no. I've got, I've got visions of you in, in the film tracing this out on the sands of Formby Point. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Just, almost, yeah. almost, yes, because we didn't mention a Killian Axis then, no, did we? But I did talk about, um, I did, yeah, I was talking banging, about tools. Banging tools true. with stone with stone. Yeah. <laughs> yes, hitting stones with stones. <laughs> yeah. um, the thing is, there's one thing that's, that is very significant about this, and that's that uh, the fact that it was unchanged for a million years proves categorically that the process was taught through thousands of generations. You know, if it never yeah. changed, then generation after generation after generation, they were teaching their kids how to how to make these yeah. tools. Yeah. Um, on top of that, it wasn't just one hominid line. There is evidence uh, showing that it was used uh, by Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, uh, and Neanderthals. Um, and uh, the the thing is, the thing that really bothers me and bothers everybody frankly is that can you think of anything anything <laughs> at all that remained the same with no refinements for even a hundred years a thousand years and at a million the, years it just becomes the completely incomprehensible unchanged for a million years it's just yeah. why it's 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 only half a million years ago that we really begin to see new ideas and developments in tool making. Just why? Yeah, what's the most extraordinary thing? So there you go. Um, yeah. Leaving that impossible conundrum hanging in the air. Answers on a postcard, please. Um, <laughs> let's go <laughs> forwards in time and kick off this month's news. Nice one, Rupert. Yes, indeed. So, what's our first news item this month, Mike? Well, lovers of the grape will like this one very much. <laughs> it could almost be another pushing back the boundaries piece, but um, it's, it's not the boundary that's significant here. Archaeologists from the University of South Florida have found evidence for the oldest winemaking yet discovered in Europe, in Sicily, believe it or not, dating to about 5000 BC. Wow. Yeah, but then a team publishing in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US has uncovered the oldest known wine anywhere in the world, in Georgia. Um, that's not Georgia the state in the US, but Georgia in the Caucasus, just to the right of the Black Sea, as I'm sure you realise. Um, but the point is, uh, they've pinpointed this winemaking at a staggering 6,000 years Ooh. BC. Yeah. Now, whilst I said this could have been a pushing back boundaries item, because it does push back the production of pure great wine by quite some time, it's, it's more the cultural significance that we should uh, have a look at here. Do tell yeah, well, to have produced wine in quantity, and there's plenty of evidence to show this wasn't isolated, means they almost certainly cultivated vines. And if they uh, cultivated vines, okay. that implies a fairly advanced social environment, rather more sophisticated than we thought for that long ago in wow, human history. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's amazing. It, it, if you compare it with other ancient alcohol production, I mean, like in China, for example, we know of booze going back nine thousand years, but it's always been a mixture of things like uh, rice yeah. and berries and grapes and honey. So uh, to find pure grape wine going back that far is amazing. Well, you, it certainly looks as if our pursuit of reverie goes back a very long way. Not just yours and mine, Rupert. <laughs> yes, yeah, we, uh, yeah, I'd be happy if mine did go back that far. <laughs> uh, right, so have, have you got any news for us? Well, I have. Now, I'm taking us south a little bit, uh, into yeah. the Middle East, actually. Now, I picked up an article about a joint project between Italian and Iraqi archaeologists. And they found a 4,000-year-old Sumerian port in southern Iraq. It's actually seven kilometres south of the town of oh. Nasiriya. Now, it's also the oldest port ever excavated in the whole region by about 2,000 years, which is Jeez. quite impressive. Yeah. Now, apparently, the structure 
is 130 by 40 meters in size. Well, that's that's big enough for more than a few boats. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it though? Yeah. But uh, see, now here's a reason to check facts, right? If you read all the articles available on this, because once once I saw that they'd found this, I did a trawl to see what else I could read up on about it. And there was one article stating that it's the size of nine Olympic-sized swimming <laughs> pools. And I thought, wow, that's big. And, uh, and then I carried on reading. I found another article which says the size of 12 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And I thought, well, they can't both be right, so let's look this up. Yeah. So I looked it up, and an Olympic-sized swimming pool is 50 by 25 metres. So uh, unless I'm fundamentally missing something, that makes the port the equivalent to four Olympic sized yeah, swimming, swimming pools. pools. I have no idea why people insist on exaggerating everything. No, it doesn't even but, work the other um, way, does it? If you're measuring by uh, volume, it's, it's just, even worse. <laughs> it's yeah, just anyway. weird. But um, but no, one other thing to come from this excavation, though, and I'm not really sure how they're going to, or how they think they're going to extract the information from it, but they say that they expect it to shed more light on the massive climate change that occurred around 2200 BC, which apparently brought about the demise of the Sumerian civilization. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, what does come out of that. Well, it will, will we? Because there's a 1,800-year stretch between it. Oh, no, 8,000-year-old. You didn't say it. You said 4,000-year-old Sumerian port, not 4,000 years BC. So, yes. Yes, yeah, 4,000 year old, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it um, is around that time. Anyway, so back to you, Mike. So uh, you, you've got another one, haven't you? Uh, yes, indeed. The last news item for this month is from archaeologists in Copenhagen. Now, back in 2013, there was an arson attack on the city's Museum of Danish right. Resistance. And the damage from the fire was so extensive, there was no option but to knock it down completely and to rebuild. It's fairly miraculous that they managed to rescue all the exhibits and only the building was damaged. It's quite staggering, actually, yeah. But uh, a new museum is scheduled to reopen in 2019, next year. But during ground clearance for rebuilding work, they have unearthed a 7,000-year-old settlement oh, wow. that nobody knew anything about. Yeah. Wow. Find includes arrowheads and bones, even some human bones, and the work continues, so it'll be interesting to see what else comes to light there. Well, you know, it's funny. It's always exciting when building work and property development uncover prehistoric remains in the middle of cities. Uh, apart from anything else, it shows you that people have been living in the same place for thousands of years. And <laughs> that makes you wonder what on earth else is right there under our feet all the time. All of which leads us nicely into the first of this month's main topics. Yes, it does. So, some of you might remember that at the end of last month's podcast, we joked a little bit about the possible confusions that could arise from Aubrey Hole 7 at Stonehenge. Well, Michael, you can update us on what's been happening there, can't you? Well, yeah. I mean, in the whimsy section last month, I light-heartedly chatted about Aubrey Hole number seven at Stonehenge. So, Aubrey Hole number seven seemed uh, apt for inclusion as a piece of whimsy because I'd learned that in 1935, the bone fragments unearthed during the whole extent of William Hawley's original excavations in the 1920s including ditch burials and, and numerous Aubrey Hole burials, had been reburied altogether in, in four Hessian sacks in Aubrey Hole number seven. <laughs> so, you know, um, which, was, which, was, which was nice, seemed, you know, we talked quite lightheartedly about it, but why had they done that? Well, there's an interesting aspect to the answer to that question, which we'll... Um, um, well, I'll try not to plot spoil right now, as it's going to form part of an answer to a question that we'll be answering back towards the end of the programme. However, in, in Aubrey Hole 7, we're talking about one heck of a jumble of bone fragments that, that they didn't at the time have the wherewithal to analyse and interpret in any archaeologically meaningful way. 
And with having no exhibition value and uh, with the pressure from the thing that I just mentioned that we'll deal with later, <laughs> the, deci <laughs> the decision to rebury was made. And so that's what happened, complete with a lead plaque explaining to any future archaeologists how the bones came to be there and, you know, just to avoid any possible confusion caused by this hodgepodge of cremated bits and pieces. <laughs> So if you've listened to last month's podcast, you will have come away with the impression that this is the status quo. Yeah. There are still four bags of bone underneath the ground, almost due east of the Sarsen Monument, just inside the bank, with nothing distinguishing their presence and nothing singling out Aubrey Hole 7 from the other 55. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly what I said last <laughs> month. However... However, yes, despite <laughs> what a wonderful piece of whimsy it was, it seems that the supposed future archaeologists have already been and gone. <laughs> yeah, not only that, but we can name them. Mike Parker Pearson, Mike Pitts, and Julian Richards. Um, mm. uh, names that uh, possibly ring a bell for anyone that's got a passing interest in British prehistoric archaeology. Uh, we don't need to explain who they are right now, but I mean, if you f follow Rupert Me on Standing with Stone on the Standing with Stones Facebook page uh, on Instagram or on Twitter, you probably know that I attended a talk by Mike Parker Pearson at the Stonehenge Visitor Centre last oh, month. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah, yes. And it should mention, Mike and I are attending a talk by the aforementioned Mike Pitts uh, this month, also at Stonehenge, and part of the English Heritage yes. Stonehenge 100 celebration. Uh, so I will be reporting on that too, of course. Of course. But back to Parker Pearson and the fact that from his talk... I learned that Aubrey Hole 7 had actually been re-excavated in 2008. <laughs> yes, the thing yeah. is, of course, technology moves on. Exactly right. And what might on the surface seem like a whimsical exercise in itself, the re-excavation of previously excavated and reburied jumble of unlabeled, unclassified, poor-conditioned bone fragments, but it had a very real purpose. The application of modern analysis techniques to remnants of a known provenance conveniently stored in a single known location. Mm. But as Parker Pearson himself remarked, it was disappointing to him and his colleagues to find that all the bones, and we're talking about remains from burials taken from almost half the area of the monument site, um, probably 59 individuals according to Hawley, yeah. But they'd been simply thrown in together with no attempt to give the, the context in which they'd been found. Yeah, yeah. But now, here's, but here's where we get to the nitty-gritty of why I thought it important to update our previous mention of Aubrey Hole 7. Parker Pearson, Pitts and Richards are big names in the world of archaeology, but this is a case where the accolades must really belong to someone in the back room. There were nearly half a million pieces of bone in those four Hessian bags. And over uh, the next years, it fell to osteologist Christy Willis. She's a PhD student at the uh, University College London Institute of Archaeology. And she had to sort through them and extract as much information as possible before the licence granted to the dig on the excavated bones ran out. And we'll talk more about that later. Mm. I need to think about that for a moment. Yes. I, uh, I mean, I, I love archaeology, but I doubt if I could be a real archaeologist. <laughs> I mean, think about the amount of painstaking work involved in sorting through 500,000 pieces of cremated bone with such thoroughness that you're able to identify the inner ear bones of 25 individuals. <laughs> I mean, not only that, but to extrapolate by careful measurement using a CT scanner the size and dimension of those inner ear bones to find out the sex of each individual. You can actually do that? Yep. Seriously, you can actually do that? 
Well, according to her own paper on her research in <laughs> Aubrey Hole 7, I, I, I quote from the paper, Forensic wow. and archaeological advances in analysing non-cremated and cremated, cremated IAMs have produced reliable techniques for determining sex by measuring the lateral angle of the internal acoustic canal. Good grief. Um, IAMs, in this case, I'm reliably formed, informed is not the cat food, <laughs> but... <laughs> But IAMs, um, that's the internal auditory meatus. Okay. Or meatus. Or it's the ear, ear bone to you. Fair me. enough. Okay. So, oh, yeah. okay. So, so, what were the results from that part of the study? Here we go. There was a ratio of 14 women to nine men. Right. Um, with, with three of them not being able to be determined which sex. Um, but that is from that 25 known individuals. Wow. More wow. women than men buried there. Wow. So it's worth saying, a few weeks ago, I posted a survey on Facebook to find out what the favourite subject matters were of our followers of the Standing With Stones page. And I made about uh, 15 fairly arbitrary choices available, um, ranging from Neolithic art to my favourite megalithic site to archaeoastronomy, you know, just to get an idea of what our fans would most like us to talk about. Now, also among those choices was Stonehenge and Neolithic culture. Far and away, the most favourited topic was Neolithic culture, while the topic of Stonehenge malingered second from the bottom. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yet here we are with excavations at Stonehenge providing some of the most intriguing insights into Neolithic culture. The, my thoughts exactly. Um, so, <laughs> you know, while this ratio of, of women to men is suggestive of a higher standing, or at the very least, an, an equal standing of women within this culture, it's, it's not conclusive. It, it is indicative that we need to keep our minds open. You know, uh, and be very, very wary indeed of any assumptions we may consciously or unconsciously make from the perspective of our own culture. Mm. I mean, how how many women, for example, are buried in Westminster Abbey? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems also that there's an indication that these burials represent an upper echelon, if not an aristocracy on the Stonehenge complex. Uh, it, it turns out that the ratio of children and teenagers among the burials is strikingly low, lower than you'd expect from a representation of, of a general population. I mean, again, I know it's not conclusive, but it is another aspect of the, the Neolithic culture puzzle brought into focus. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the very least, a cemetery for grown-ups, then. Yeah, yeah, and, and a cemetery it was. When we were looking at the largest cemetery in Britain in the third millennium BC, no question. And again, this is something that's been underlined by the excavation of Aubrey Hole 7. During the excavation, a previously undisturbed cremation burial was discovered right next to Aubrey Hole 7, just under the turf. Now, this is remarkable... Because William Hawley was supposed to have excavated almost the whole eastern side of the Stonehenge monument in the early 20s. So the implication is that if he missed this one, he must have missed others. Mm. Um, so, so what this has enabled them to do is, is to provide new estimates of the total number of burials that are reckoned to be at Stonehenge. And um, Pitts and Parker and... Uh, uh, and Richards et al. have um, boosted uh, the estimate to perhaps uh, 240 burials overall at Stonehenge, yeah. Right. <laughs> Moving on, there's even more. There's the strontium isotope analysis carried out on the Aubrey Hole seven bones. <laughs> yeah, well, this is a very new technology. Um, it enables archaeologists to infer the geographical areas an individual is from, or, or even where they lived for reasonable periods. Uh, remarkably, it seems that 40% of the individuals represented in this collection of bones did not grow up on the Chalkland of Wessex. In, in other words, they were not Stonehenge locals at least in their early years anyway, yeah. uh, I mean, further, four of the 25, you know, minimum 25 number of individuals identified 
grew up in areas of uh, of geology consistent with Western Britain, like in North Devon and Wales. Uh, so, uh, you know, if if we start to think about migrations from Wales, uh, what what can we begin to imagine is the correlation between the movement of people from Wales and the fact that the blue stones at Stonehenge were relocated from Priscilla. So they were taken from Wales yeah. to Stonehenge, you know, to rebuild the circle. How much does that fit together with uh, with that migration of people? I know, it, it, it's quite an intriguing thought, and I think um, that uh, um, they're going to be looking into that uh, possibility mm. a lot uh, in the coming years. Um, based on what we know uh, of the research that's being done at Priscelli right at this moment, or you know, during the last uh, last year or so. But but talking of bluestones, here's just one last example of how Aubrey Hole Number Seven is informing thinking about the development of the Stonehenge Monument. A bonus from the excavation of the bones in the hole was the excavation of the pit itself. Now, the Aubrey, holes, the Aubrey holes themselves have long been a mystery. They were first recorded in 1666 by William Aubrey, for whom, of course, the holes are named, and it was conjectured early on that they may have originally been the standings for the Blue Stones, which uh, now, what remains of them, are standing within the second stage Sarsen Monument. However, this idea latterly has been out of fashion with all sorts of astronomical alignment theories, you know, the confusions of dating, the fact that there were many burials in the holes, and theories that there may have been wooden post holes, especially since the discovery of Woodhenge. What has been found, though, in short, is that Albury Hole 7 shows itself to be too shallow to have been a wooden post hole, but just the right size and depth to hold one of the blue stones. Mm, so, putting this together with another look at William Hawley's excavation notes for the other Aubrey holes, Parker Pearson, Pitts and Richards have been able to conclude that in the first stage of Stonehenge, the Aubrey holes did indeed hold the upright blue stones. That means that stage one of Stonehenge was, as well as the bank and ditch, pretty well a sizeable but fairly straightforward stone circle, albeit one that has been transplanted 150 miles from a previous location in Wales. Ah, but that's another story. <laughs> Maybe for another time, but I hope you'll all see why we felt compelled to update the so-called whimsy of Aubrey Hull 7. So, shall we move on to rising seas and lost archaeology, the uh, main subject of this month's podcast? Rupert, do you want to tell the folks what it was that started us off down this particular voyage of discovery? <laughs> yes, uh, voyage is about right. Uh, well, it started when we were looking into the discoveries and excavations up in Orkney that we discussed a bit in the last podcast and the team's unexpected discovery of a lot of megalithic remains about 500 metres offshore. Well, that just made us think about the fact that we have a lot of information on how changing sea levels have affected settlements, sending homes and even entire villages into the oceans. You even see it happening today. Yeah, you certainly do. Sometimes it can happen remarkably quickly. Apparently a great example is on the north coast of the Isle of Man, where I was actually born. I, I lived there till I was six years old. Um, because of the strength of the ocean currents, the coastline up there has disappeared a staggering amount within living memory. There was one particularly violent storm in 1941, when two metres of coastline, several miles long, got washed away in a single night. That is terrifying. But the crazy thing is, the sensible side of this hardly ever gets discussed. I mean, the kind of stuff you tend to find in relation to anything to do with submerged remains is random claims of Atlantis being found all over the place. The reality is... There are an enormous amount of submerged sites around the world. 
Obviously, on the podcast, we only have time to look at a few, but as always, links to everything discussed on the show will be on the website, and that's uh, standingwithstones.net. And for anyone who wants to look more deeply into the subject, it really is amazing quite how much there is out there. Yes, you know, something that's niggled me for years is that as an animal, we know that we actually haven't changed very much for a very long time. And we know that as a species, we do have a preference to settle in coastal environments you know, throughout history. All settlements begin by the sea, and over time we migrate inland. Now, if you look at every civilization we actually know about, from the Mesopotamians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Romans, and later the Aztecs, the Olmecs, as many as you can think of, they've all existed within the last six or seven thousand years. But if we project backwards, and take uh, take out the standing with stones usual marker of Gobekli Tepe. That's a hugely <laughs> sophisticated site, roughly ten thousand years old, with its earliest megalithic stages dating back twelve thousand years. Well, a site so complex and beautifully designed doesn't arise in a young tribal community. No, no, no. These kind of structures only come from a civilization that's been around for a very long time. Yeah, 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 even down to the cultural developments like writing. Egyptian hieroglyphs in their earliest known form must have already been around for quite a while, and you wouldn't think that a nomadic tribal group of uh, hunter-gatherers would really have much need to develop a complex system of writing. Exactly, exactly. So, so where are the remains of the earlier people? Now, taking that on a tangent, if we delve into older geology, we do know that sea levels were much lower during and in the later stages of the last ice age, so say 18,000 years ago. Now, the weight of those glaciers bearing down onto the earth acted like a dam, holding back vast amounts of water. And as the glaciers melted, not only did that put meltwater into the rivers and oceans. It also freed up a lot more water to evaporate into the atmosphere. And all that reduced the weight of the glaciers until they could lift free of the underlying rock. Now, we know of a number of glacial collapses that occurred a little under 15,000 years ago. I think it was about 14,600 years ago, something like that. And we know that over a 300 year period, sea levels rose about 15 meters, 45 feet. And th there was one particular glacial collapse in North America, and it released 500 cubic miles of water to surge across the planet. If we're depending on coastal regions for any kind of development, you know, what chance would they have of any kind of settlement? I mean, can you imagine the size of the tsunamis that those kinds of events must have created? Unbelievable. It's an interesting point that most cultures around the world do have flood myths. It makes you wonder whether all the stories come from earlier and long since vanished civilizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, let's start with something closer to home. Sea Henge. Yes, yeah, Sea Henge on the Norfolk coast. Yes. An upturned tree in the centre of a wooden circle and arguably the most enigmatic Bronze Age site in the British Isles. I mean, we don't need to get into how unique and odd this place is. The point is, for our discussion here, is that the site was sufficiently inland when it was constructed. Over the thousands of years, due to the fragility of Norfolk's coastline, all the land between the circle and the sea has simply eroded away. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it really is an oddity. Uh, of course, it's quite likely that they only used wood because there's virtually no usable stone to be found anywhere in East Anglia. Of course, yeah. Uh, but, um, but nudging ever so slightly further out to sea, there's something much more recent that we do know about. There's Cleopatra's Palace off the coast of Alexandria. <laughs> from, from the sublime to... <laughs> or is the other way around? <laughs> from, from the ridiculous from the lump to the sublime. Of tree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there he <laughs> the, the thing about Cleopatra's Off Norfolk palace. to Cleopatra's palace. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the thing about Cleopatra's Palace is yeah. you can you can dive down you can uh, you can take a holiday you can dive down to swim amongst those remains there's sphinxes and pillars and pottery all over the seabed uh, and the wonderful thing there is that we know how it connects with the contemporary artifacts on land so it, it's more like a jigsaw puzzle where we actually had the picture on the lid of the box to help us fit it all together. And we also know that the destruction was caused by a huge earthquake and resulting in tsunami around 1,400 years ago. The oceans have always reclaimed the land, and we can see that all around the world there are going to be submerged settlements going back much further into the past. Now... Off the coast of Pavlo Petri, for example, in southern Greece, under about four metres of water lies a 5,000-year-old town, uh, as complex as any other of its time. Uh, a team from Nottingham University have been diving and excavating there for quite a while, and they've created a full 3D digital construction of the or reconstruction of the entire town, and I, I, I mean, I've, I've, I think I've had a look at the, the, those pictures, and it, it's quite remarkable, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, we're talking about three thousand BC, yeah. uh, so we're talking about you know we're still back in the Neolithic, and it looks like a perfectly normal, nice. Sort of towny villagey. It really type does, place. doesn't it? It's just, yeah. it, it's it's extraordinary. It, it's it's nine acres. This site spreads across, which is you know that's a good old size, really. And it looks just like any other town, really, with you know two story houses and streets. There, there's there's yep. even uh, you know they've found that there are waterways and all sorts of things are constructed there. It's just you know it makes you think. It, it seems mysterious to us simply because it's underwater. But it, it was just, it was a thriving town at the same time as the Egyptian civilization. Yeah, yeah of course, we can go back much further. And a particularly fine example is in Hano Bay off the southern coast of Sweden. Archaeologists from Lund University have found a 9,000-year-old settlement under 20 metres of water. The remains here are fascinating because when you consider the age, one of the items is a pickaxe made from elk antler with inscriptions on it, and there are also some Decorate. fish traps made from lengths of plaited hazel. So, you know, these are not primitive people. No, absolutely. Absolutely not. No. And, do you know, I, I, I think we should probably say here, <laughs> because... I can imagine a number of listeners might be screaming at us. But what about Yonaguni of Japan, <laughs> and what about the city off the uh, off the, or under the ocean of the Bay of Cambrai off uh, Gujarat in India? There's <laughs> there's any number of examples of these, you know, extraordinary undersea uh, sites. But the the thing is that we do our very best to only bring you the prehistoric stuff that, that we can actually verify. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with so many of the more exotic sites is that people so want them to be real. I mean, I want them to be real to come to that. <laughs> Absolutely, you know? yeah. But what happens is they dismiss some of the important details that call it all into question. And, and, and sim some of them really are simply natural rock formations, however engineered they may look. Others are still being investigated in order to, to establish whether they really do warrant excavation. And don't, don't worry, we'll tell you all about those too if we hear any exciting news. So, has that kind of wrapped it up as far as um, underwater things are concerned? I, I, I think so. I mean, it's worth, worth repeating, I suppose, that we will put uh, all the necessary links onto the website and, and we will include some of the links to sites that, that we haven't included in this for the very reasons uh, yeah. we've just stated. 
Um, but but some of them are still you know, they're still very interesting to look at. You can form your own ideas, and uh, you know, do send us messages if you don't agree with with anything that we've said. I I, know, I but, would extend yeah, it's, it's, you know it, it a little bit further is that also not only uh, have coastal areas been areas of settlement, but they've also been channels along which migration have has occurred. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. I, I yeah. think this changing sea level is a very important aspect in the whole um you know development of of humankind uh you know uh, and mm. and the effects that it has on the development of culture and the and settlements and so and you know clearly the movement of human beings from one place to another uh, and um, and yeah. and yeah, I'm I mean, beautifully we- reminded there of um, how privileged we were to be able to look at the footprints uh, on uh, Formby Point, the 6,000-year-old yes, footprints absolutely. there. That, that was a real treat, and uh, if they haven't gone already, they won't be there I for have long. been told that they have yeah. gone already, the, well, certainly the ones we were looking uh, at, but um, hopefully more yeah, will be exposed yeah. as, as time goes by. It shows how transient everything is. I, do you know what? It's worth saying there as well, maybe that you know, thinking to archaeologists in the future that uh, that the consensus generally is that if if the uh, carbon dioxide uh, increase in the atmosphere, if the melting of the polar ice caps continues the way uh, that uh, the scientific fraternity expect then over the next century or so, sea levels will rise by 60 metres. Now, if you think... A sea At which level point rise of we become metres, part of the story, yes. Uh, it, absolutely, <laughs> that's it, exactly. And, and you know, you, you only have to look at all the coastal uh, settlements, cities, etc., around the planet uh, to realise that 60 metres really, really gets rid of an awful lot. And on um, on that bombshell, um, <laughs> <laughs> let us move along. Indeed. What's next? We have questions. Question. We have question, or we have a question anyway. And um, we have been putting it about that we would uh, like people to submit questions t- for us to answer in this section of the podcast. Is that not so? <laughs> Yes, we have. We have. And a lot of you seem to be very shy in doing so, but we have had How a strange. Few. I know, yeah. So, do, you know, feel free to dive on in, folks, and just you know, anything that you want to know about. Um, if, if not we not don't too hard. Know, not too hard. <laughs> <laughs> but if we don't know, then, you know, we, we will, you know, we have a lot of resources um, at our disposal. So, you know, we can always um, do a bit of research on your behalf. Happy to do yes, that. Yes, we've got all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. So, so this month's question then. Yes. Are you going to take this mic? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I shall. Well, we had a question from Mo, Mo Keown in Hertfordshire, who's one of our... Uh, She's one of our greatest fans. Uh, she we is. like Mo very much. And we thank her um, very much for being one of our biggest fans. Indeed. Um, now, Mo, she, she does come up with a good question, does Mo? Uh, she's asked this time, what happens to all the bones when they are excavated from prehistoric sites? And it's a wonderful question because there is no single answer to that. Um, so, uh, Mike, you've actually done some research on this independently, haven't you? Well, kind of, and half by accident as well. Um, you know, and it's an answer that's very much of, of two halves. I mean, the basic, the basic answer to the question is, for the most part, it seems that uh, bones that have gone through the archaeological process um, end up usually in you know the basements of universities um, all over the country suitably filed away and uh, uh, and and catalogued and and all that so th- they can be accessed you know at a moment's notice when new technologies perhaps come along 
um, so that they can be examined in new ways. You know, to mm. uh, uh, and if people are re excavating a site, that they've already got some kind of context, you know, for what's already known. Um, so that's a very sort of broad answer to that question. But also, it very de much depends on something else. And it's to do with religion, strangely enough. Um, <laughs> uh, and that, that is, in s strictly speaking, according to law as it stands, excavated bones should actually be reburied. Crazy. Well, not necessarily crazy, but sometimes crazy. Uh, I, I think archaeologically speaking, uh, the more recent the bones are, certainly if they come into the Christian era, then I think that's reasonably strictly enforced. When the bones are prehistoric, mm. um, it's a debatable and moot point. <laughs> I mean, the reason I found this out, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go back to Aubrey Hole Number Seven, as Ooh, I said nice. in the earlier <laughs> earlier section. You know, the part of that was going to part of the uh, story of that was going to be told in um, the answer to the question later on, and and here it is. Mm. Found out at, um, at listening to Mike Parker Pearson that um, when they were doing the uh, research on the bones that had re been re-excavated from Aubrey Hole 7, it turns out that uh, they only had uh, five years license from the Home Office to um, study the bones, after which they needed to be reburied. So there was a lot of stuff to be done with the bones. It was a bit of a race against time for uh, Christy Willis, the osteologist, uh, who was doing the bulk of the study. And in fact... So do you mean she was doing the... She was going through 500,000 bones under a, t under a deadline? Yes. But, uh, oh, as, far as, uh, I, as, as far as I know, that's what was going on. Uh, and the five years actually ran out and they had to ask for a, an extension... And they got an extension of another two years. Right. And that two years was still just running out <laughs> when, uh, and, and, you know, it was touch and go stuff. Uh, Mike Parker Pearson got a call and the, um, the, the licensing thing had moved from the Home Office to the Department of Justice. They had updated their thinking as to how to treat particular archaeological investigations. Uh, and they told Mike Parker Pearson that instead of reburying them um, at this uh, deadline, and it was a matter of days, apparently. Wow. <laughs> um, and he had the shovel in the hand ready to put them back in the ground. <laughs> that in actual fact, they could be stored in Salis Salisbury Museum instead. Right. So, you know, another interesting story from uh, Aubrey Hole 7, but illuminating to, uh, slightly illuminating to Moe's question. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It is that there is a grey area. Now, the other interesting thing is, and I think this is why we, perhaps why we get the feeling that a lot of people, that Mike Parker Pearson himself is not favourite with a lot of people, in that he's the uh, figurehead um, that um, uh, counteracts people like uh, Arthur Pendragon, who strictly do not want bones to be disturbed, and indeed want any bones that are on display in the, in the Stonehenge Visitor Centre and elsewhere returned to their burial place, original burial place, uh, in the monument. Right. And that's where <clears throat> archaeology um, meets head-to-head -head with... Um, um, romantic um, idealism. That is interesting, isn't is it? Is that a good way of putting it? Romantic idealism? Um, Shall I put that in well, another I way? Well, I think that's fair, but then, you know, I suppose there's <clears> going to be a number of people that don't. But it's also interesting that, you know, <laughs> why would a druid seek to have jurisdiction over anything Neolithic? Um, <laughs> but maybe we shouldn't go there. It, well, it's an ancestor yeah. thing. It, it's, a, it's, it's an ancestor mm. thing. Um, which is all well and good if you know that those bones in the ground are your ancestors, yeah. for sure. And, of course, the people that um, put them in the ground in the first place for that very reason, whether it be in a long barrow or a chambered 
can or what have you, uh, to remain in contact with the ancestors, then uh, unless mm. you've really got that uh, relationship, um, it's a bit um, fill in the gaps. So, so I suppose, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to wrap this up, uh, you know, a good thing to say to Mo is that if you were particularly interested in the bones from a particular site, then you really just, uh, I say just, but you, you just have to find uh, who was it that did the excavations of the site, and it'll probably tell you which university uh, or museum has taken possession of them. Yeah. I, I'd certainly, I mean, the, the only one that I know off the top of my head is um, is the Tomb of the Eagles, because we were talking about it previously. The Tomb of the Eagles was excavated by University of Bradford, um, and... Uh, after Ronald Simpson himself. Yes, 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 uh, yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> latterly and on a much more scientific basis. So, mm. uh, so the the uh, the bones there will be with the University of Bradford and the Orkney Museum. So, I hope that um, answer, which was rather quite specific and rather vague at the same time, <laughs> is uh... <laughs> we good at that. <laughs> Our speciality. <laughs> yeah, totally good. So, yeah, thank you for the question, Mo. What's next? Oh, it must be... Um, oh, yes. Go on, give it some. Stonehead of the Month. Yes, Stonehead of the Month. And, um, Rupert, I'll, I'll leave it to you to uh, tell us <laughs> yeah. who uh, who is Stonehead of the Month in this month of um, June. In this month of June, the Stonehead of the Month is Mr. Jeff Watson. Flint never extraordinaire. Uh, yes. Do we get the round of applause? Well, hey, Jeff. Hey, hey. Yes, we do. Je Je <laughs> we, we were doing a live broadcast. Je we, we didn't know Jeff before. Um, he's a member of the Moot, the Standing with Stones Moot, and it just came up in uh, in messaging and in the course of online conversation that Jeff was a flint napper. So we said, "Oh, do post some pictures." And good grief, his work is stunning, absolutely stunning. So I said, yeah. uh, "Where can we buy your work, Jeff?" And he said, mm -hmm. "Well, he sells odds and sods, but it's just labour of love, really. It's a hobby." Now I, I just I can't help thinking that. If Jeff had a shop, he would be selling <laughs> these things all the time. They're just beautiful. They really are. Yeah. And so we couldn't not bring his work to your attention. We'll put um, we'll put a link to his the the stuff that he posted in the moot so that you can see just how beautiful his work is. And it's lovely that there are still people doing what our ancestors used to do. No, you can't say fairer than that. You know, he, he could seriously sell those stuff. There is a, a market, believe it or not, up and down the country, you know, whether it be for reenactors or uh, collectors or uh, what have you. Um, there, there certainly is a market. On the other hand, one fully understands sometimes it's much, much happier to keep something a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, isn't that the truth? Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, take take all the pressure and stress out of it and just do it as you feel. Uh, but you yeah. know, I have to say for myself, I have every intention of pestering uh, Jeff to let me uh, buy some pieces off him because I, I just think his work is is genuinely stunning. So there you go, quite Jeff, right. Well Congratulations, done, Congratulations, Jeff. You are the Stonehead and, of the month, and thank you for your support as well. Uh, Indeed. Of, uh, us and uh, standing with stones etc great good job right so um let's move on oh <laughs> whimsy is it oh is it that time um yes whimsy well i'm i'm pretty sure that the bit of whimsy that i've got um, for you this month well, we won't be revisiting in a future episode in order to correct, <laughs> update, authorise uh, or validate in any way, as we've done with Aubrey Hole 7. No. Um, how can I start this? Who, who remembers Morph? 
<laughs> Rupert, do you remember Morph? <laughs> of course I remember Morph. God bless Tony Hart. Absolutely. Yeah, what was the name of the programme we all used to watch? Um, it was... Oh, was it... Uh, oh, it was Take Heart, Take wasn't Heart. it? We are I so when I was dating kid, ourselves. Was, we are so ageing well, ourselves right now. We and are, probably but if a few you go of our, before that and Vision On. Do you remember Vision oh, On? Oh, crimes, yes. On? And, and probably a few mm. of our uh, listeners as well. Um, <laughs> dear Tony Hart. Yes, did you know that Morph was first produced by... Uh, Ardman Animations for the BBC. Um, you know, we're talking bef well before Wallace and Gromit and before Peter Gabriel's Gabriel's um, uh, Sledgehammer, Sledgehammer video, yeah. yeah, which they also did. So that 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 kind of you know interesting stuff. Morph, um, Sledgehammer, Wallace and Gromit. There's the there's the trend. Of course, Ardman anim Animations are still going. Um, strong. Um, but anyway, I was sitting here... What the hell has this got to do with anything oh, uh, archaeological? It was just... It's, uh, it's so <laughs> silly. I was sitting here at my computer, and I have a second screen off to my, um, off to my right, and, and I have a, a Twitter feed, a tweet deck going there, sort of, that, that just has a feed with um, megalithic stuff going past. And uh, I, I glanced uh, one day a few weeks ago to my right and did a double take because there was more <laughs> popped up staring at me out of the screen in front of Kalanish Standing Stones. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean actually there? Actually there, yes. In a brand new uh, <laughs> photograph. Um, yeah, it, it turned out um, that one of the uh, founders of Ardman Animations um, has, uh, of course, a complete rights to uh, Morph. Uh, and he's uh, Morph is one of the Ardman Animations, you know, he's in their stable. And for whatever reason, um, uh, Peter, um, Peter Lord was uh, doing a tour of the Hebrides with morph in his pocket or in suitcase, whatever. And it was going through the Hebrides and through Scotland, you know, and everywhere and occasionally plonking morph in a, a in an appropriate uh, pose, taking a photograph of, of him and tweeting it out. Uh, with hashtag morph tours the Hebrides or something like that. I think it was remember it uh, it it was. So he's been to various places, but I just happened to glance around. There he was in front of <laughs> Kalanish <laughs> standing that stones. Is, that is so silly and so wonderful. Uh, well yeah. done, Peter Lord. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So leave that there. Could wait on, but what do you got? What do you got? And will we need to come back to it later at a late date to <laughs> update and correct? And give it well, depth and meaning. <laughs> This is just an odd one. The, the truth is, I can't honestly say why I found it whimsical. It's just, uh, this is from France. It's the Western France, actually, uh, not far from, well, it's kind of well north of Bordeaux and um, in the Vendée. Yeah. And it's a trepanation, so the, the drilling of holes in skulls. Uh, to relieve all sorts of ills or, or even there's conjecture that sometimes it was done in humans to release evil spirits and Lord knows what. Oh, I think that's. But, I think um, it was, wasn't it? That's, that, that's pretty firm evidence for that, isn't it? Written about? What, releasing evil yeah. spirits? Well, it's a funny old world. Well, the thing is that they found a cow skull <laughs> with a hole drilled in it. And um, so... <laughs> The things about this are the kind is that was this poor unfortunate cow just a a practice beast? You know, were they practicing on it to uh, to, to get <laughs> to get the technique right before they used it on people, or because there was there's no um, it, normally with humans um, where they find a, tre a practice of uh, trepanation, there's healing around the hole, which shows that the person. Uh, survived the operation and um, uh, and the bone healed afterwards. Well, this cow shows no such <laughs> no such healing whatsoever. So the options are either it was practiced on an already dead cow, or yeah. it killed the cow, um, or they were practicing trepanation and uh, it it was unsuccessful and it died anyway. Poor animal, but um, yeah. I just thought trepanation on a cow. No, we, that that has to be uh, 
thrown into the mix, isn't it? So uh, it was actually found quite a while ago, but the uh, but the research into the actual trepanation is uh, is comparatively recent. Uh, but so it just shows. You it just shows, doesn't it, that thing of of anything um, element of culture that's uh, apparent. Um, it can't just have sprung into existence. There must have been some practice behind it some development you know it, it's uh, we, we so take for granted things that suddenly appear in the record yes. but they can't suddenly have appeared there must be of some there, there must be a history of the the culture that is completely and utterly lost for us and it's just Absolutely. fascinating well, uh, too. well the thing is this skull is it it's it's over um it's over 5000 years old um it's been dated to between 5,000, 5,400 years old. Um, but the thing about trepanation is, who was it that first thought it was a good idea to drill a hole in somebody's head? Because it's not really something you'd think about doing, is it? Unless you've got a really bad headache. <laughs> it's, but it's one of those things that, um, you know, I, I've often thought with things like, you know, who first discovered popcorn? for example, must have frightened the life out of them. But then they find that this exploding fire suddenly is offering something good to eat. You know, that maybe somebody uh, had had a massive accident and it had made a hole in their skull that maybe relieved a problem that they had before or something. And people thought, oh, do you know what? He was better after he had that. You know, it, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Who Don't know. knows... We probably never we will probably do. Probably never will. That is so true. But it's all but, fascinating um, nonetheless. Yes. So it's nearly time to end the show, but first we'd like to ask for your help. Yes, we've set ourselves a big goal in launching these podcasts and creating live streams, videos and other stuff for you to enjoy. And that is to raise enough awareness and funding for us to make another film about the standing stones and megalithic heritage of Britain and possibly further afield as well. We'd like your help in getting to the first stage in that adventure. When we reach our first Patreon goal of £1,000 a month through the support of our followers, that'll free us up to devote the precious time needed to start developing Standing With Stones 2 properly. It'll mark the point of commitment where another film becomes a reality. There'll still be a long way to go, but reaching that goal will give the momentum needed to follow through on all the enthusiasm and loyalty that our dear fans have shown us over the years since the first film. We think we proved ten years ago that just two guys could produce a broadcast standard compelling motion picture about our Neolithic and Bronze Age ancestors. But there's still a big story to tell, and you can help us tell it by going to patreon.com slash standingwithstones and becoming a patron of the Standing With Stones project. You can do so for as little as a dollar a month, but there are other levels of subscription too, with all sorts of perks and rewards available for larger commitments. So go now, look for Standing With Stones on patreon.com, choose a level of patronage that works for you, and join the other megalithic enthusiasts who are part of this journey, helping us to explore the mystery of the stones. And with that, Rupert, I think it is time for us to end episode three of the Standing with Stones podcast. Thank you so much for listening, folks. Yeah, thank you indeed. As ever, we could go on saying <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but we won't. But we, but we won't. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> we will indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.